Um, tonight's recording and, and webinar is going to be a Q&A with uh, Jim Irwin. Lots of you already know who he is. Um, we'll be going over kind of Jim's background as well as a little bit of information on the school. Um, and then we will be taking lots of questions um, and, and having Jim kind of answer them. So it's a great way to kind of pick his brain a little bit. Um, the way that you do that, again, like we were talking about before, um, and there have been a couple of people that, that wrote in there under the question area um, to answer my audio question, so thank you for that. That's where you do it. Go ahead and submit questions there. There's also a chat button. Um, I'll keep an eye on both of them throughout the whole webinar, and then we'll see if we can't get um, everybody's questions in by the end of the hour here. And usually we do. I'm usually pretty good about that. We've got a couple things um, that people have emailed in as well, so we will. I will do my best to make sure we get to everybody's. So without further ado, um, I'm just going to go ahead and in case I don't, everybody's kind of coming from a different place, especially for this one with all of Jim's followers. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and uh, really quickly here talk about the school so that you know who we are. Um, and uh, oops, sorry, too far. And um, so just so you know, in case you haven't heard of us before, the Sonoran Desert Institute has been around since um, the 1920s, you know, in one way, shape or form. Uh, and the School of Firearms Technology is, is what we represent here today. Um, we are accredited uh, by a national accrediting council called the DEAC. If you want more information on them, um, their website is deac.org. Um, essentially what that means is that we can offer accredited programs. Uh, the whole school is accredited and we do have um, full degree programs as well as other programs and courses. So. Um, one of the things that we're known for is offering firearms, whether that be gunsmithing or firearms technology or armor courses, anything firearms related, we offer that. But we try to be um, the, the place in the market that you can go if you don't want to pick up and move and go to an on-campus program of some sort. Um, and we offer a lot of flexibility because a lot of our students are military or work full time or, you know, we have deployed individuals um, that take our courses. So we try to be as flexible as possible uh, with scheduling. Um, everything is shipped to your door. We walk you through it. You have an online learning management system. Our instructors are top notch individuals within the industry currently. Um, and we do offer six different programs and courses. Um, I mentioned the Associate of Science and Firearms Technology degree already. That is a full degree program. Um, there, there are a couple of general education courses that you'd take with that, but almost everything is firearms related, so it's a really fun curriculum. Um, that's a two-year program. And then we have an advanced gunsmithing certificate, um, which is almost a step below that, so it's without the general education courses. It's not the full degree, but it is a very extremely um, well-rounded, uh, comprehensive type of curriculum. It'll go over everything from you know, the basics of gunsmithing to running and operating a successful business to shooting sports management, um, anything that you would need to know for a career within the firearms industry, we, we cover that in that course program. Jennifer, the mm -hmm. thing on those two courses is that they are both, uh, you're able to use if yep. you're a former military, military, you can use your GI Bill on. And that's huge. Um, and we are in the process currently of working with the Department of Education. Uh, and are, are so, so, so close to having more news on that. But um, once that approval happens, um, we are working towards then accepting TA as well. We used to be able to do that. Um, they made us jump through a whole bunch of hoops. All schools jump through a whole bunch of hoops. Uh, and we're very close to having news on when and whether that approval is going through. So um, when that happens, it'll be a VA, TA, Anything military related, we can work with you on, on those two programs. Um, additionally, we have a non-credit course called the Gunsmithing Certificate, great for hobbyists, people who want to kind of do a little bit of the side business. Um, and then we have a Ballistics and re Reloading Certificate, which is super cool. We work in conjunction with Gun Digest on that. Um, it's all reloading all the time. It comes with a Hornady lock and load press. And then two armor courses, AR-15, AR-10. It's basically the same program with the two different platforms. Uh, we have a couple programs in the works, but before anybody asks, I don't have any news on those. Just keep an eye out on the Facebook page. If you're not subscribed to our newsletter yet, please do that. You can do that at sdi.edu. You'll get all the information as soon as it comes out, both on the TA stuff and any new programs. 
that come in. So <clears throat> again, any information that you would want on the school, you can find on sdi.edu. Um, and of course, we, we update things on social media all the time as well. So you can find us there too. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and dive in here. Jim, <clears throat> I put some, some, I guess, some talking points on here, almost a little bio together of you. And I want to go uh -huh. over a lot of this. I'll do a little overview, and then I want to kind of get deeper into some of these things, because I think a lot of people are here tonight kind of to, to hear firsthand stories from you and kind of understand where you're coming from. You've got such an interesting background. I think that's, you know, that's why most people are here tonight. So um, obviously, you're the, the SDI School of Firearms Technology spokesman. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but really, yeah. um, this, the the credentials that you have within the army are, are really exemplary. Um, and for those of you who don't know, uh, we're, we're talking about an individual here that, um, that doesn't come across, you know, that doesn't come along very often. In fact, you are one of five that is that right? In your hundred person course that was, there was uh, almost just, just under a hundred guys that uh, went to selection with me and at the end of the day, uh, for lack of a better term, only only five of us made it out the other side. Right. For one or another. Right. So then after, you, and you were there for, you were in the Army for 11 years, is that right? Yeah, a little over 11 years. Uh, okay. A little shy of 12. Okay. Decided that uh, just, I need to move on. And then Bill you, Clinton was my favorite person. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I think you're, you're not alone in that sense of it either, so. Um, so. And after that, you went into personal protection, is that right? I did. I spent... Uh, better part of eight years mm -hmm. in uh, high threat uh, protection, working in combat zones yep. and uh, high threat areas around the world. And yep. Went into the went into the Balkans and uh, did in Sarajevo for about three years. Mm -hmm. And then decided I wanted to check out Iraq, so yep. I went and I took a took a contract in Iraq for about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. and I went to Israel for a year, and then I spent a year and a half in Afghanistan roughly. Right. Okay. And then. And we'll get into kind of that transition in a little bit, but then you, most recently you've been um, with tactical products and in more of the sales and, and that side of the industry before this whole, before you kind of broke off on your own and did the consultant brand ambassador stuff. Is that right? Yeah, and I just kind of, I kind of fell into the brand ambassadorship thing. It was more uh, when I came back from uh, Afghanistan, I was just tired of getting shot at and blown up. So sure. I wanted to break. And, <laughs> and uh, so I decided to, uh, to hang out at home for a bit and just screw around and golf and uh, ran yeah. an old buddy of mine, actually a former Delta guy, and he asked me what I was doing and he told up this uh, tactical gear company that he's been working with. It's pretty big one. It's called ADS. So they're still around. They're pretty big, pretty big in the tactical industry. Um, and my job would be to go on Fort Bragg and talk to soldiers and warriors about the new new high speed gear, find out what they're trying to get a hold of and what they're lacking and help them get it. I was like, man, that's that's awesome. You yeah, know, that's not a bad gig at all. <laughs> think like I do that and help them get gear. Awesome. Right. Uh, and it just kind of stopped from there on the tactical gear side. And then in doing that, I started to get a, like, I guess, a, a decent reputation in the industry as being a guy that just, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I refuse to sell anything or push a, a brand that I didn't, I wouldn't wear in combat or put on people I love. Uh, you know, if I didn't believe in the product, I, I didn't. I wouldn't stand behind it. And right. I had a, a reputation for that. And I was like, hey, you got to believe in what you're doing. Right. Not just sell crap to sell crap. Um, and so some of the you know, new new brands that had some good background and, and some high-quality stuff started asking me if I'd be interested in helping them out like that. And then after I left ADS and was doing my own thing, I uh, started with Cryptech, Cryptech Outdoor, a new camel pattern. And uh, the co-founders and I just got along really good. I mean, she and I used to live with one of them for a while and uh, asked me if I wanted to be on their pro staff. And I was like, well, what do I got to do? He's like, well, wear my stuff and shoot stuff. <laughs> I, like, no, I think I did that. Sounds terrible. <laughs> pull that off. And, uh, so it just hit it off and it kind of just took off from there. And I've got about seven brands right now that I'm working with. Yeah. Uh, so that keeps me busy on top of doing some private security as well. And sure. And traveling around doing that as well. Cool. Very nice. Well, let's back up a little bit. Um, I'd love to kind of talk about, let's first kind of go over what got you into the, you know, what was the inspiration behind joining the Army? 
um, and kind of what made you climb the ladder as well. You know, I'd love to kind of go over that side of things. Okay. You want, you want me to start? Yeah, go for it. Uh, baby steps. You want some readers digest? <laughs> no, just uh, start with what do we? What made you want to join? You know, what was the initial uh, yeah. "I'm going to enlist" moment? There was something early on. I, I I was probably 11, 12 years old when I I just had this uh, this idea that I I needed to be in the military. I wanted to you know go out and see the world. I didn't want to. I grew up in a small town in the, in the Sierra Nevada mountains in California, Mammoth and June Lake, California. My hometown was about 600 people, and my high school was 75 kids, 7 through 12. And I didn't want to stay in that town and work on the ski lift or something. You know, nothing, nothing, there's anything wrong with that. I just, I wanted to go do stuff and shoot things and mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. know, challenge myself. And it started early. I'd hiking all over the mountains. I'd go up to 11,000 plus feet just, just to go do it, you know, and go fishing and hunt squirrels or whatever. Right. Uh, me and some friends and. So early on, I, uh, you know, not too many people know that I wanted to be a Marine, you know, go figure, because, yeah, you know, being called an Army man didn't sound cool, <laughs> but being called a Marine pig. Right. And when it got closer to me going in, uh, I did a, I called the Marine recruiter and asked him to come down and visit me in my small ass town, and he never showed up, so I got stood up before I even, you know, attempted to get in. Oh, it's like, well, terrible. I'm, like, I'm getting screwed over already. You know, what's that, you know, what's that say about the Marine Corps? God bless them. I, love, I got a lot of Marine buddies. Right. It wasn't for me. I ended up meeting this Vietnam Ranger who was a little low-key guy in my hometown. And we got to talking, and he told me some stories. I'm like, that's exactly what I want to do. Yeah. Uh, so I got a hold of an Army recruiter, and, you know, the rest, I, they say it's history on that. I, I got a hold of them, and obviously they try to talk you into doing everything but what you want to do. And I stuck to my guns, so that's sure. I'm not a Ranger. I'm not trying it. And he said, well, that's volunteering quite hard. I'm like, oh, okay, so? So I should just quit now? That doesn't work in my book. So uh, I got my unassigned ranger assignment, did everything I needed to do to, to get there, and I got assigned to second ranger battalion up in Fort Lewis, Washington. My my biggest goal early on, I, I didn't even know what Delta Force was when I, when I signed up. I just knew what rangers did. And uh, I wanted to be a sniper. I read all like the Carlos Hathcock books, and, and, and I was really intrigued about that. And I really enjoyed being able to you know, make long distance shots and, and hit my targets. And so that was like my early challenge and drive was to get there and figure out how, how I can become a sniper. And I, I did that early on. I was in the regular line for ten for about a year, which uh, is kind of normal. And at that time. The range, which I, they change it all the time, and I don't know if they still do or not, but at that time, we had designated marksmen within the platoon, so I was a saw gunner, but my, my secondary duty was a sniper with the, another guy. Um, went to ranger school, came back, and right after that, they moved it into a sniper section, so I went over to the sniper section and uh, stayed, stayed in the sniper section for pretty much the majority of my time in the battalion, and uh, went to uh, sniper, Army Sniper School, was don't know how I did it, but managed to be the senior trauma graduate out of there. I've been mm -hmm. to the Special Forces Sniper School, and I was top five in there. And, and really, placement doesn't matter. I mean, you all come out of there with the same, same skill sets. It's just who makes a shot, who doesn't on any given day, or doesn't get caught in a stop. Or, so I'm not – I don't believe it makes me better than somebody else. It just – I just got <laughs> I was a little more sneaky on one day than they, they were or something. Who knows? So, but, uh, sure. Really enjoyed that. <laughs> Rangers was – a passion, and yeah. everything else kind of took second place, even a, even a marriage, unfortunately. Uh, you hear that a lot, though. That, I, I feel like that type of thing happens a lot, you know. Absolutely. Well, that um, was young for, it was just growing up in the mountains, loving to, you know, hike around and chase animals, and, and, and it's kind of funny, you know, a short story on that too. Is my stepmother at the time was a wildlife biologist. She's actually the one that taught me how to land navigate. And, I'd go out with her in the woods, and she could ID birds and stuff just by, like, their, you know, sounds and stuff. And she did, like, the bighorn sheep study and spotted owl studies. Well, I just, on my, after she taught me all this, I just go back out and try to shoot the birds she showed. <laughs> <laughs> Is this a secret? Are you not supposed to be talking about this now? She's going to be mad at you forever now? Oh, man. She, she, you know, when they, early on, I thought I'd be sneaky and I could use a paint gun because it was quieter, <laughs> paintball gun. Uh, there was, like, paintball marks all over the trees. Oh, and, no. Uh, I busted myself. You know? Oh, and my so gosh. I was out bed and paint on them. So it didn't go and big paint all over them. And I got so <laughs> Oh, my. And what, about what time, what year are we talking about here? How long ago is this? Uh, in my high school era? 
No, when you're uh, your mother in law was the high school era, or are you talking about when you were a ranger? No, that's when I was growing up before I, I ever joined. I was, I was oh, like, I thought you meant that was you know, you were here you are an no, army was, ranger and you're out paintballing. I was 14, I was Fourteen years old <laughs> out there doing that stuff. Uh, oh, too funny. That was like my, my young motivation to sneak around. Right. Right. <laughs> Uh, so, okay, so so after Ranger School, what, walk me through that. What happens then? But after Ranger Battalion, I, uh, I I went up to up to Alaska of all places, ended up in the regular army, and uh, mm -hmm. quickly realized that the regular army wasn't wasn't my cup of tea. Right. Uh, Ranger is a volunteer unit. If you don't, if you're not if you're not putting a, you know foot to ass or doing your job, then you get asked to leave. So you, you have to be performing, and when I, so I went up to Alaska trying to get into the airborne unit up there. Well, they were like way over on uh, sergeants E5s. They were like 150 percent for their quota. Ooh. So I ended up in this regular army unit over there, and it, it wasn't bad. It's just the it's the kids that I had. I guess we were all kids at that time, but uh, we're, we're the more motivated up in the what they call the scout platoon for in a company, which was kind of like they a little elite. Uh, the regular the line guys are. You couldn't get them to do anything, man. Was just, they didn't want to be there anyway. They were just biding their time to get their G, or, uh, their GI Bill or what have you. So anyway, mm -hmm. I, I made. I was there two, exactly like two years for the month. Uh, you know, I'd get 70 something, 72 below zero. I think it got one. Oh one my winter. gosh! And that summer it got to 104. So I mean, just amazing country where you see both ends of the spectrum. So I've been out in 72 below wet degree weather trying to you know the mission came second at that point it was like we need we need to survive right <laughs> that's just oh my gosh cold, you know? that's uh, crazy nobody wants to fight with that cold i don't care who you are right and, uh, so we uh you know sheltered up and then that summer man you'd be out playing softball two three four in the morning and it's like dusty out in like 85 degrees but that summer got to 104 so just a really interesting place right uh but not it wasn't for me it wasn't uh, it wasn't a challenge and, it, and i wanted more and mm -hmm. uh Lo and behold, a Delta recruiter came through, and I was just like, "Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'll try." <laughs> Raised my hand, and uh, tryout started the next day with a, a, a PT test, you know, physical training test, mm -hmm. and then uh, psyche valve, blood work. It was over a year uh, from the time I started till I was actually put into a squadron. To, oh, see, um, I didn't realize it was that long of a process. Yeah, it's, it's better better part of a year. Wow, it was a. And you had your stuff had to be correct. I mean, you, if your blood work wasn't right, decline. I mean, just the smallest thing. They were looking for a specific thing, and then you go out and you do your selection process, which is kind of funny. You know, you know, quick story on that. So I, here I am, kind of naive. I've been a ranger. I'm hard, and, and, and I don't have quit in, in, in me whatsoever. So I get, you know, yeah, you won't make it. You're too young. <laughs> I'm like, oh really? That's my like my platoon sergeant told my buddies. You know, so I get selected to go to to tryouts, the selection process, and I get out there, and you know, so I'm fortunately I, I somehow make it and then get through, and they're like, all right, well, we're gonna have you come out to uh, Fort Bragg, you know, and then your operators training course will start, and I'm like, huh? Like I, I was naive enough to realize that didn't even realize that there was a second phase. That was just the <laughs> easy to go to select, like the actual <laughs> operators. <laughs> So I went in there kind of blind, like, all right. So every day was a was an adventure because I had no clue what the hell was going on. Oh, that's too funny. What are the types of things that they made you do when you're in the try in this tryout process over the year? Well, the, the initial tryout uh, selection process is uh, it's uh, out in the mountains in uh, in the on the east coast uh, in area, and I won't get into details on that. Sure. People want to try out, you'll find out. <laughs> but, uh, it's uh, it's actually uh, based on land navigation, so you every given. Any given day, you're uh, you're, man you're navigating through mountains and uh, hitting checkpoints. You never really know if you're done or uh, or you get to keep going. And so there's never there's nobody screaming and yelling at you. You just you get your task and you, you go and and see what happens. So yeah. some people get hurt. Some people don't make the time standard, which you don't know what the time standard is. Uh, pretty much, if it was flat ground or downhill, I was running. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's I have cool. another buddy who made it. You know, and he did he did a different a different technique, but I. My opinion, what I think they're looking for, and this is at the very raw base level, that by no means is all they're looking for, is, is consistency. Can you do that day in and day out, or do you come in, you know, guns blazing, and then four days later you're petered out and you know, smoked on the side of a mountain somewhere, right. so you can't keep going. So that that's no good. <clears throat> so. Interesting. 
And after the year was up, what was the process like? Well, then uh, when I was, <laughs> well, you uh, go through another board there, the commander, mm -hmm. what's called commander's board, and you get asked a bunch of questions. You feel like an idiot. <laughs> like a beauty uh, pageant contestant? Yeah, you come out there thinking, well, not like that, but it's, it's like they put you in some scenarios and, and whatnot. And, yeah. You know, that's, that's you and what how they think you're, you're, you are. And, uh, but basically, you just kind of like bring you down and just to, to this base level, see how you deal with it. And then you know, that's what they judge you on. I can't really get into that because it's, it's different for everybody, I'm sure. Yeah. You know, so for me, it was just like, hey, you know, I, I, you got an entire stable of you know, purebred scallions. I just want a chance to be one of those. You know, right. You can't offer any part in what you already have except for another one to pick from and then they help. But, uh, so fortunately, I, I was lucky enough to uh, have, have what they were looking for at that time. And I think the best quote I've heard to date was from a, a former unit bud uh, uh, who said that they don't look for the best guy, they look for the right guy. And oh. I firmly believe because there was better dudes than me in that class that didn't get picked, uh, in my opinion. And uh, them are just animals. And one reason or another, I'd get picked and they didn't. Looking Very for the right guy, but so you never know what that is. Right. A well guarded secret. That's so cool. So you were the, yeah. what you were part of the Delta Force for how long? I was there from uh, I got there in ninety six and left in ninety eight and I got in a little bit of trouble. Uh, so I ended up uh did a deployment overseas and uh, met an Air Force girl who was an officer and I won't get real deep on that one, but anyway we ended up getting together and my my unit wasn't real happy about that. So uh -oh. I had to go. <laughs> I was just about the bad operator or shooter. It was, they didn't like that decision. So I was enlisted. She was an officer. And uh, so uh, they, they just asked me, and, hey, well, sorry, you gotta, you got to go. Yeah. I won't get into at all the details. Of oh, it. Sorry. There, but I ended up marrying her, and uh, we were together for about 17 years. So. Oh, my gosh. Good for yeah. you. <laughs> so uh, I think I made the right choice, personally. You know, right. It was, a, it was a great place to work, but <laughs> it wasn't one of those that, was going to define my future, and, and you have to realize, and I, and I and I I can't emphasize this enough to the people that are listening, and and, uh, and uh, hey, please don't pass judgment on me. Everybody has their days, you know. Everybody's got a skeleton somewhere, but oh, sure. the date. What you have to realize is you're simply an asset in any of those things. Whether you're a SWAT guy, Marine recon, you know, pick a flavor, uh, the uh, pro football team. You're not the day. You're not an asset. You're done. So should that define you as a person where I spent almost 20 years with this woman, you know, completely in love and and uh, together where you could be in the unit or one of these elite jobs, and the day you're not out there, you're done. They don't love you. You're, you're, sure. you're a tool, you know. Sure. So I kept that I kept that in the back of my head. I was hurt. I was bummed that I left and, uh, you know, pretty distraught about it when I, when I didn't, wasn't able to go back after my year. Um, that's why I thought I was going to get out. And I did. I moved on, you know, and I think I've been doing okay ever since. Right. <laughs> kind of killed the time and broke my heart, but I think in the end, stuff happens for a reason. Yep. And, and I'm by choice, and, I, and I'm a better man for it. I had okay. a fun time, and uh, you know, got to do it and, and see it, you know. And okay, cool. You got out alive, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. Very nice. Now I've got a question here um, <clears throat> that I think is going to be a nice segue into kind of the next segment. Um, Corey asks, how different is working as a personal security detail op operator overseas with the military versus private security details? Is it pretty much the same, or is it a totally different model? No, it's way, it's, 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 a, it's a different animal altogether. It's different, uh, it's a different game, and I don't know, how do I put this? So, what's the last name on this Corey person? Morris. Corey Morris, Okay. Uh, I just curious. There's a Corey Messino that follows the band. I hope uh, oh. you know, she's pretty. She's pretty cool. Um, so the personal security on this side, you're looking at more etiquette stuff, and uh, you're out there in the public eye. And you got to be kind of touchy feely, and so a lot of the work is done behind the scenes, and where you plan in case something bad happens, but realize that you're getting paid because these guys have bands, and they're out there 
this is on the celebrity side and that they need to be able to interact with them. So if you come out there all tough handed and smacking people, you're not gonna have a job for very long. Right. <laughs> Where on the on the protection side doing high threat man, I was wearing body armor helmet and, and open gun. Like I didn't I wasn't there to be friends with anybody and, and I didn't take shit either. So that that was a whole different game. You're there over like in your face and it was going your way and that was the only way it was gonna go. Uh, so you had a lot more freedoms to a point where on the uh, private security working for like high value people and, and celebrities is more uh, it's like emotional man it depends on who you got <laughs> how touchy feel you got to be or if you're asking questions at the right time or you just sit there quiet or they want to talk about their favorite football team sure. you, know, you got to know when you can be friendly and when you got to be professional and right. sometimes that's a, that's a hard hard uh hard one to figure out and I can give you an example you know grown adults on my first trip to Germany with the with this client I have and they're like hey let's, we're gonna go get some food and I sit down and we're at a like a pub and he's like hey, you want a beer and now I'm like okay am I getting tested here right so, like I'm supposed to be working like you know, you know you're paying me I'm right <laughs> So how do, how do I do that? You know, right. so my, my wheels are like, am I getting set up here? And I'm like, no, I'm like, and he's like, come on, man, just have a beer. Nobody's around. It's just that. It's, you know, so you can get put in situations like that. Okay. So, yeah, I got one. And then, it, then afterward, you know, I talked to my team lead, and he's just like, dude, you can't really do that. And this is why. And he hit around the head, and I felt like a dumbass for not thinking about it. But I got that one beer, and we leave there walking back to the hotel, and we get some sort of confrontation with a fan that's over the top. And I've got beer in my breath, even though I'm not drunk. And so you gotta, you gotta think about that stuff, you know. But you can't be, uh, you can't offend your client, but you also have to be the professional side of it. And there's a time and a place that you can do these kinds of things. Didn't have to worry about that kind of crap in combat zone because you just didn't drink. You went out there and put right. your ass every day, get blown up. And yeah. So just, and we went to the gym. Every day. So that's uh, that's my difference. I hope that answered your question. In, yeah. In, in the manner, of course. Yeah, he, he said he has conducted PSD operations overseas and just wasn't sure about the private sector. So Yeah, yeah. Where were you at? What was that? Where where did where did you do this? I don't know, Corey, where did you do your PSD stuff? Iraq. All right. Thank you for your service. And thanks for going out there and putting foot to ass. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. He says you as well. <laughs> um so since we're talking about this security stuff, um, walk me through a little bit. I know that that seems to be, um, it makes sense to make that transition, you know, from where it's you were. An easy, it's an easy transition when you come out. And, and I will say this up front and foremost. You don't have to be a Delta Force operator, Green Beret, Aikido, Black Belt, Dojo, Swami guy to do protection. It's what's sure. between your ears that, that really saves your butt most days is being able to think through what you're doing and have some some common sense, you know, and a good education on it. Where I do see value in, in having some high-end training is when uh, the bad things do happen. You know how you're going to react because you, you've been in those scenarios before. Right. Uh, where if you're, but you can be an everyday police officer, uh, you know, firefighter with EMT training that wants to get into that and get a little bit of training and do it. You don't have to be a high-speed individual to do it, which I think is kind of a lot of people think that's the case. Uh, no, man, just be smart and, and, and know how to conduct yourself and, and be vigilant and be able to plan. You know, you want to plan for what could potentially happen. Inherently, the job is a reactionary type job. The only way you're proactive is by planning, you know, doing your rehearsals and making sure you got your vehicle down, drills, down, all that stuff down beforehand. So when that moment, that chaotic, chaotic, chaotic moment happens, you know what the hell you're doing. You're not just frozen in... in Wondering where the hell, what car do you run to next? You know, it's it's already thought out. That's the only that's the only proactive stuff you have. The bad guys decide when they're going to hit you. Right. Yeah. Well. <clears throat> okay. And you were in security for four years. Is that right? Uh, in what high threat? Yeah. So about eight, almost okay. eight years, and I'm thinking, again still doing it. I, I did my first protection gig actually in the army with the unit uh, mm -hmm. in '97. Um, and just got back to Mexico City doing some stuff, you know, Mexico with uh, some clients, my clients, uh, a week ago. So I was down there for about a week. I leave for China with them in a couple of weeks, and then to Europe in about two weeks after that. So still doing it. So we're on almost 20 years now. Wow. And how often do you... Not, not me yet, but 
again, the, the celebrity is not is not the high threat combat zone stuff where where bad guys trying to take your life every day. This is more of a hey, can you know, probably should let go now so I don't have to do something silly. Right. <laughs> and you prefer it that way, or you prefer more of the high threat stuff from a personal well, preference I, standpoint? Each one has their pros and cons. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would. I am happy I did the high threat stuff again because my whole career I've, I've literally just wanted to challenge. I had no reason to leave Bosnia. I could have stayed in Bosnia for a decade with the ambassador I had and been happy. You know, it was a great spot uh, for being high threat. It, it was a it was a good good job. Same Israel, another cool spot. Except, you know, going in the West Bank and Gaza got a little area here and there, but not mm -hmm. not always. Uh, so I'm glad I did both sides because I wanted to experience it. I wanted the knowledge. I wanted to test myself to see if I could do it. Uh, getting into the private side and the, and the low threat, you know, uh, celebrity and high value client stuff is a, it's another ball game, and it keeps me relevant. You know, I'm still in the game. I'm still learning and, and challenging myself in different different ways and, and how I deal with you know locations. Well, one of the things from early on, like I like I said, is I wanted to see the world I live in. Right. And this provides me that ability. I'm over 50 different countries now. And, yeah. You know, somebody else is paying for me to go be able to see that. So That's, awesome. That's awesome. So, awesome. And I get to stay in a nice hotel instead of a hut in, in Iraq. <laughs> so, right. You know, so it has the pros and cons, you know. Sure. I'm not getting to kiss anybody if that's a pro. I don't know. Yeah, that's that makes sense, you know. <laughs> but I um, get to travel. I get to countries, you know, the world. How much do you travel? How many days a year about? Uh, over 200. Ooh. Yeah, over 200 days a year. But not just with the protection stuff. There's all the... Uh, Come off of that. I've been doing some stunt work of all things in, in L.A. You know, for some TV shows, TV series, and uh, and then I've oh, been, uh, I'm doing a, I'm doing a zombie movie in, in Texas next month. So actually, <laughs> like a week and a half. Then I'm gonna go to Oregon for something. Uh -huh. and, and, uh, just had a, a, a we we're gonna climb Mount Hood this in July, and they, they had to cancel it just because the weather so bad got hot up there. I guess mm -hmm. I get a lot of snow melt and rock debris. But, so I, I'm pretty constantly going different places and doing things. Right. You know, like the brand ambassadorship stuff and, and trade shows. I stay, I stay pretty busy. Yeah, and let's talk about that. So once you got out of security, and you're still doing some of the security, but <clears throat> how did you transition into the more retail sales, tactical gear, that side of the industry? It was coming out of uh, coming out of the high threat stuff and coming out of Afghanistan and needing the break. A buddy of mine asked me if I wanted to do it. So when I landed that gig and working out of Fort Bragg, I said, this is it's pretty darn cool. I enjoy right. this, and I'm getting to play with all the gear and see some of the stuff that I do have and see how technology is really driving, you know, the tactics and, and, and the gear that's being used. I mean, they didn't have a cell phone where I can watch bad guys run out the back of the building. I'm getting ready to go into the front door of. Right, you know, like, right. That's, that's some amazing stuff. And I, I got a kick out of that and being able to uh, listen to the warriors, the bad boys, and the guys out there kicking ass and say, hey, how can I, if I can't shoot bad people in the face anymore, how do I help the guys who are? You know, yeah, <laughs> like, you know, absolutely. That's can't possible, you know, and educating you on what's out there, listening, which is a huge asset, listening to what they're after, and then go find it, man. Go bird dog that thing and, and go help them acquire it, give them every asset and tool to do it. So I enjoy that. And it's turned in now to uh, not so much doing that for the units and stuff, but more for the, now I'm working for the manufacturers mm -hmm. um, and becoming an asset for them for like social media and doing sure. like this. I was out there with FBI, you know, and myself for the Colorado Freedom Shoot and representing the company and demoing the stages and using all the gear that I um, sponsored with and letting people check it out, you know, and that brings value to these companies. And I get a kick out of it because I get to interact with the guys, you know, the people uh, that right. are doing it. And I get to interact with, educate myself on the uh, the brands and what the, you know, loophole optics and, you know, proof mm -hmm. research through these high-end carbon fiber barrels, SDI, and, let, you know, learning how we can help guys who tinker most anyway with guns and, how, and show them how they can use their GI Bill and, you know, and learn how to work on firearms at their pace. How awesome is that? You mean you're going to send me an 80% complete weapon system? I'm going to that's brilliant. You know, it's not just a, okay, here's a book. Right. And uh, this test, and now you're a gunsmith. Yeah, that, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, brilliant when they show me the concept of, uh, of the 80% thing and you get hands on. That's, right. That's, that's uh, so total win. So I'm excited about going out and talking to people about that kind of stuff because I think it's this massive value that I can help educate people on. Yeah. And tell me about the, the, other the Colorado Freedom Shoot. <clears throat> that, that was just last week, right? Last week? Uh, Maybe the week before? 13th. Yeah. 
walk me through that. Uh, I saw all the pictures and everything. We've got a blog post coming out about that. Um, and we had a couple guys come back and they were like, oh, you should have seen Jim Irwin. And it was so cool to like. <laughs> what, have I fallen down or something? <laughs> no. No, 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 no. They, you know, they, a lot of people spoke very, obviously, you're still, you're still an extremely skilled individual. So I think it was neat for I, people I, to kind of I, see I that. I stay relevant because I, I, I believe that if I can't, like, again, be, be out there, you know, putting bad guys down, how do I help the right. guys who are, um, I'm able, I believe, uh, because I have a decent history, you know, and got to do some unique things, that I'm able to talk to just about anybody, uh, if you want to put them, like, on a scale, you know, from, you know, world-class shooters and, and soldiers, warriors, athletes, pick one, all the way down to your most humble, you know, paramedic in a, in a backwoods country town, uh, and hopefully bring some value and ideas and, and excitement to what they're trying to do, so... If you're the standoff guy, and you're only going to talk to the, the the best shooter out there with his jersey on. That's only because you're too cool to talk to the next guy. You, you you're doing yourself and in, in, in your company and your brand a disservice. So I, I I'm very personal and very approachable in that stuff. So when I got asked to go to Colorado Freedom Shoot, I didn't even actually compete. I would go out I go out there and as a as an ambassador to the companies for one, but also uh, to demo the stages, show these guys what I'm using, how I would run it. I, you know, I can't do it. In the, in the beginning, because you know, might give them an unfair advantage on the, the competition. Right. Sure. But if I go out there and, and I suck, you know, who's really going to pay attention? Right. <laughs> you want to do yourself a favor. You know, do it right. Sort of you know, I'm not at the top of my game. I could practice a lot more. We could always practice more. But you know, you want to you want to leave a good impression. Like, okay, this guy knows what he's doing. And, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I I could probably listen to him and you know try this out, and that might uh, get them interested in a certain like a barrel. You know, that's a high end barrel or a school or a piece of kit that I'm using, and, and you also build the relationships and, and, and friendships out of it, and, and take it, you know, take it, continue to grow that. Sure. Very cool. Um, okay, I've got a couple questions here that have been coming in, and actually a couple of them have to do with concealed carry and your everyday carry. Um, okay. Let me get to the first one here. Do you believe in daily carrying, and what uh, qualities do you look for in a concealed carry platform? Uh, I do uh, believe in it. Unfortunately, I neglect it sometimes because I do travel so much. So when sure. I do get to my hometown <laughs> here outside of Reno and Tahoe, but I, I strap it on. And what I look for is that every – man, there's just so many ways to answer this question because everybody has a different idea. So here's what I'll say. I carry in the way that best suits me. Mm -hmm. I use a Glock 19. It's lightweight, easy to use. It's quick. Uh, I change the sights up fairly really quick on any on any, <laughs> any weapon system I have, so they're, they're high visibility, easy to fire. Um, even if you wanted to run a, a red dot on a pistol, I see no problem with that. It's an advantage. You're able to pick that sight up quickly in and up in a high stress situation. If you're pulling that gun out with the intent of using it, I promise you, your heart rate's going to be high and your eyes are going to be big. You know, and you're going to need to find that front sight and, and do what you need to do uh, accurately and not cause harm to. Uh, uh, you know, civilians around the, in the area. So in saying that, I, I I have some personal favorites. So I like to set the Glock 19, put some good, good uh, sights on it, and I've been running a Black Point holster that's a, a really nice rig out of the, out of Georgia. These guys do some really neat work. Recommend them. Uh, but when we start getting into like sh chest, like shoulder rigs, I'm not a fan of it. I, I just think they're slow, cumbersome, and, and leave uh, a lot to be desired. A little Hollywood. You know, I'm starting to do stuff in Hollywood, but you know, like, uh, <laughs> you need to practice with what you got. Appendix carry is a good system. You need to practice it. You know, I run it on, on outside the waist on my hip because I have done that hundreds of thousands of times. So right. that's, that's where I'm going for it. You know, so that's right. why I wear it. Uh, you know, cover it up with some clothing, but have your have your practice down. Have you know, with what clothing you wear, how you do it. Practice, you know, 10, 15 draws before you go out. You know, make sure it's empty and, and just work that scenario through your head. So if that moment comes, what I see out there that is kind of a, and my dad does it, and I give him grief for it, is guys will look, I love my 1911, love my 1911, badass piece of kit. It's heavy. And what you'll see people do is, okay, I got my 45, and, and they put it in the center console of their vehicle, and then they go in the store. Well, where's the problem probably going to happen? In the store and your gun's outside. So what right. I recommend on that, guys, is, you know, Find what works best for you. Practice it to your good. I don't believe that there's any one perfect uh, answer for it. So see what works for you. The Penix is a great one for vehicle stuff. You can't always get to it on your hip unless you practice that. 
is how you're going to maneuver your body so you can get that drop. I'm left-handed. If I'm driving, I'm against the door, so I got to you know, twist in the seat so I can get to my gun, and I'm going to angle my shot because now i got to work with an you know, offset of the window and blah, blah, blah. Panic Scary is a great setup for that. Not a lot of people know that, so practice that draw. Find what works for you. Um, there's a lot of junk out there, some like just floppy nylon stuff. If you want someone's got some attention, it's going to hold the gun. So if you get turned on your head you know, in a conflict, the gun doesn't flop out and become you know, a liability to you. Right. Does that, does that answer the question? Yeah, and there was a, a little bit of a follow-up here, too. Um, <clears throat> and we, we talked about it already. He's asking whether or not you open carry. Um, he, the, and this guy, this is the same Corey um, from before. He's worried that the, you know, the quote-unquote bad guys are going to end up shooting the person with the gun first, so the open carry first. Um, so he's, he's worried that the quote-unquote bad guys in a situation are going to end up, like, picking off the people with the open carry first. So... Oh, open carry, open carry. Yeah, versus concealed, yeah. Open carry versus oh, concealed. Uh, I, 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 hey, to each their own. I, I won't personally <laughs> open carry. I, I, I don't believe in flaunting it. You know, that's that, that's that quiet professional type of deal. I want to have the asset and, and, and know how to use it and use it well in case mm -hmm. I have to protect myself and the people around me. Yeah. Um, but I'm not going to just sit it out there and just say, like, hey, I got a gun. You know, right. they, you're just asking for shit. You know, right. Have, in my opinion, again, to each their own. And I, I don't, you know, I believe in, 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 in guns and God, you know, but unfortunately it, it could cause more problems than, than, than needed unless, you know, where you can be concealed and, and just avoid it. And that's that common sense thing, again, I go back to with, you know, thinking about the shit, you know, thinking through things before you do it, like in protection. If, you know, open carry there in Iraq, cool. I'm not going to open carry in a freaking Lincoln Park concert. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I just ask it for grief. You're, you're, you're going to get into like, people. <laughs> Carrying AKs into into freaking IHOP. That's just it's unnecessary. Right, right. Want an AK in your car? Cool. I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm not. I'm pro gun every way you can, but just just be smart. You know, it, it weigh the pros and cons, man. Is that going to work to your advantage? Are you just abusing because you, you can open carry? Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And and actually, yeah. both guys that that commented on that little thread say that they 100% agree with you. So I think awesome. we're we're all. I know you were worried. I work yeah. <laughs> um, now I've got a next question here or another question. Um, oh, here, here's one. So Brett asks, I'm currently taking the basic ballistics course. Um, during Army, sni Army sniper school, who built your cartridges and what were the typical mil spec rounds? Um, uh, so in, in my day, it was, uh, you get taught a little bit on the reloading, uh, but not a, you're shooting Lake City Brass. It's this factory, uh, 173 grain boat tail, I believe it was. Army mass grade stuff that they, we got by the boatloads. Uh, using a M24 308 platform was the big, that's what we used. In 91, 92-ish, we started to get into the Barrett 50 cal stuff for like airfield seizures and shooting at aircraft, you know. Uh, and getting that long range, I mean, we were using that thing at 1,700 yards, hitting, hitting, knocking out bus windows in a, in a range. We were using M2 ammo, you know, the, the, the Modus, you know, 50 cal machine gun ammo, because they just didn't really have match grade stuff at the time. So technology, man, it, it really pushed the ammo, you know, pushed it so much further. I, shoot, I was shooting a 16-inch 308 uh, uh, LaRue, you know, AR, 16-inch barrel on that thing that's holding a less than two inch shot group at 500 yards up. I mean, shoot. I mean, that's beyond the capability down there. The, the, two, uh, the M24 I was using. I mean, so the, now that the quality of the, the ammo we're using, the, the, the ballistics that we're able to see, the quality of the craftsmanship that people are putting out there, you can do some really cool stuff. You know, one of my favorites right now is the you know, 300 wind mag. Is a, what, a, what a beautiful rifle. I mean, you can you can hunt animals after like 1,500 yards that thing. <laughs> I mean, yeah. animals. You know, that's not, not always people, but, you know, this is – what a high capability gun! You can throw a suppressor on it. You know, there's just really some trick stuff out there. But um, 308 was the standard, and it was military, uh, military grade ammo ball. Uh, but it match grade stuff, uh, Lake City, I think was where it was doing. I don't even know if they do it anymore, but that's what it was in those days. Good, cool. Um, Eric asks. <clears throat> He says, I was a QO uh, warrior pilot for several ODA teams downrange. How did you translate your experience 
into something marketable where civilians understand you. And Jim, you and I were kind of talking about this a little bit right before it started, you know, with the with the relatability thing. And um, so what, what do you have to say to Eric on how you take your past experiences and kind of translate that into civilian yeah. friendly stuff, well, you know? The civilian side is, is the first, I think first of all, that's a great question, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and it can be it can be answered several ways, just based on personality. Uh, not everybody who was a warrior, you know, hello kilo pilot, you know, at the highest levels. You know, and, and, and I would even go as far as say, not everybody in the military when they transition to the civilian side, not everybody gets it. You know, right. What we've done, how we've done it in the brotherhood, sisterhood. Um, we're just a different animal for a while. You know, when we crack jokes about your mom and just like, I never met your mom, but we're going to talk crap about right. it. So that's what we did in the army. That's what we did. Uh, and then you crack that joke to a civilian guy, he, he lower lip gets all puckered out and, like that, and you're like, dude, I'm kidding, you know. So it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a kind of a generic answer to say, hey, kind of feel feel your uh, feel your surroundings on that. But what I did is instead of Instead of putting, I didn't put myself on a pedestal, I guess I can say, because I had cool jobs that I looked down on other people. I, I, I would stay humble. I'm, I'm actually extremely humble that you, this many people would even get on just to hear me flap my gums. I mean, that's, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, be approachable. Be personable. Don't, don't uh, be afraid to share some of your experiences, but uh, know your crowd so that uh, you don't blow them out of the water too, too, too bad. I've done that before. You found some you know, club dead people and funny and then they freak the hell out and you think it's funny but <laughs> so, but when you start talking about the industry like the tactical gear industry you can use your background as an asset because you've been there and you've done it you've used the kit you're probably looking to to represent or work with um, whether it's through giving them suggestions on function and fit or how you used it where you used it or and believe it or not your asset your biggest asset for me when I started was I know the community. I know the people I'm talking to, so I, I could relate to the soldiers and and then translate civilian speak of tactical gear, you know, nylon sewing monkeys to soldiers, and your background directly reflects that. Now you're coming to them as an end user and a fellow brother, not uh, a sales guy. So you have to kind of balance it between being. being more long, more long. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And you're, you're what I'm understanding is you, you have to find a way to balance kind of the yes, I am an expert, but no, I'm not necessarily better than you, <laughs> right? Is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you ask my opinion, awesome. I, I would love to share it with you. Right. So my, this in my opinion, uh, but I'll tell you, like in the shooting side, I've had my ass kicked several times by some country boys, and here I am an elite. <laughs> Trained sure. you know, once upon a time guy, and I think I'm pretty dang good. And this country boy steps out at you know five nine, three hundred pounds, and burns me down. <laughs> you got to have a little humility. And like instead of being pissed off, I high five the dude. I'm like, that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> How the hell did you do that? And then you then you become the student, man. We're always in the, so don't just. Uh, my best advice, I guess, is just be, be humble and, uh, and and use your assets, use your background to. To promote you as a, a as a person, but don't let it override the, the somebody else's job or what they do for a living just because they didn't serve or something. I guess you know right. humility. I think sure. is a make decent, but uh, be approachable. Be willing to share your, your your stories or what you have to offer. Realize that not everybody might want to hear it. I ran into that more often than not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. So here I was, right? <laughs> cool. Gotcha. <laughs> Good tip. <laughs> Um, okay, I've got. I think we can get to these last two. We've got a couple minutes left. Um, and Julio, I'm just dying over here reading this question. Uh, I may edit some of this out. What is your advice when encountering gunsmiths that, that don't believe in the online program SDI offers? As a Marine, it's hard to respect these individuals professionally when the judgment comes straight out and you want to, and I'll edit here, uh, cause bodily harm <laughs> to these people. <laughs> yeah. Uh that goes to ego again, and, and right. unfortunately, you're going to see that here. You have sure. there's a few actual gunsmithing in in uh, in residence, I guess you call it, where you there's one outside of Fort Bragg, a few hours in Newari, where it's a you go to the college and you learn the technical skills right. of running a lake, sure. CNC machines, and that hey, that's awesome, you know. And, uh, and kudos to them. And it is, and, and we as the school feel that way too, you know. What you're doing, 
what you're doing is attempting to educate yourself. You're not doing it for someone else. Right. You know, so you know, shame on them and, and you know. I don't know if you can cuss on this one, but F them for just for <laughs> looking their nose at you, you know? Right. You, you don't need their blessing, man. You know, this is for you and what you want to do. Um, this is the the level you're at right now. Maybe someday you can go to that uh, technical school, but right now you're a, probably traveling or you don't have that, that resource near you, so you're doing the next best thing for you, and that's taking this course so you can better educate yourself on building guns correctly, safely, and, and for personal use, and maybe after a while then you are and doing some stuff for other people for a little bit of money. But um, the, the one thing I can say is it, you have to be, at the end of the day, you can't please everybody, um, but then you please yourself, man. Do, do, if you're out there to try to please everybody else, and I'm not saying you're doing this, but it, that's a dead end run, it, and, it, and it's almost impossible to do, and you'll drive yourself not to doing it. So if you're bad enough, then so what? You know, maybe he's not on your Facebook friend list. And, uh, but you're still getting that education, and you're getting a firearm out of the deal. Yeah. Right. You're still getting your blaster. You, know, you get to you get to build it how you want to do it. And if they want to be cool and, and help you out and give you some advice, awesome. If they want to be assholes, then you know what? Maybe you just don't you don't call them back. Right. I, I hope sure. that helps you. But first and foremost, take care of you and what you want to do and what you believe in doing. If I listen to everybody else, I would have never tried out for the unit. Yep. And, and I just won't believe in that. Cool. I like it. Um, this last one's just kind of a fun one. Um, what drills would you recommend for the AR platform to increase accuracy and speed? Uh, AR platform, accuracy and speed. Uh, I, I would tend to, I lean towards uh, the, the first one comes first, accuracy, uh, you know, speed's fine and accuracy's final is, is, a, is a common quote. Mm -hmm. uh, so working on your accuracy is a, Work on the drills that you're bringing the gun up to target and when you're acquiring, acquiring your targets and your sights quickly. And that will, as you get better at that fundamental, again, please understand there's no there's no secret sauce to, to shooting. It's just who's mastering the fundamentals and at the, at the pace you can do it. The quicker you are at those fundamentals, the quicker and faster a shot, better a shot you become. Um, so when you see these super high speed dudes, they just, they got these fundamentals down. And where you pick up speed is once you're able to pick up uh, let me back up because I can get I can get way deep on this. <laughs> uh, where I see the biggest uh, lull in time, like in competition, is target to target transition, and what that typically equates to is the ability to go from your, your, you you acquire your target, you put the sight on it, you make your shot. Then there's a tendency, especially with optics, to swing to the next target without bringing the gun down or getting your eyes moving. Uh, you stay in the scope, right? And then you swing it over, you overswing the target. So your biggest low times are usually from target to target. The quicker you can get at that, finding your front sight, making a nice solid shot, and getting your eyes ahead of the, of the optic, you know, even if it's just glancing to that, you don't have to bring the gun down below ready. Um, learning how to acquire your sights quickly and make accurate shot will learn, will speed up the, the speed side. I hope that uh, that makes sense. Um, once you're able to do that quickly, you'll learn how to transition from target to target quickly because you'll be able to acquire target or your, excuse me, sights faster. Does, does that make sense? The quicker you can find your sight, the quicker sure. you make your shot, the quicker you can move to the next target. Uh, and then find that sight, uh, find the target, and then put the sights on it. That transition from target to sight post or dot, you know, scope, is typically the hardest thing to get um, dialed in. You know, that, that target to sight, target to sight. And the faster you can do that, the quicker you're going to be. And I've seen you just humming with it, and then you see guys that are, like, putting keyhole, you know, just two shots right on top of each other. Accurate is awesome. And then it's a second and a half, two seconds to swing to the next target. So it's like, pow, 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 pow. You know, because you're right. Shots are awesome. I can spread that out a little bit because I can, I can, they don't have to be touching. They can be two inches apart because I'm swinging to the next target already after that second shot rings. Um, so the drill, to get back to the drill, I would practice on, A, pre presenting my rifle to the target and getting that nice crisp sight as quick as I can, find the target, put them, switch the sights, and then go from there from switching from, put like a target six feet apart. So it forces you to get that gun moving and swinging from target to target and finding that sight and dropping the hammer on that thing, uh, you know, right as soon as you're, you're seeing, you know, pause you positive uh, math that you can put shots on. Right. That, that's a pretty easy drill to set up and will really help you start acquiring the site and, and get those 
transition times down because that's that's where you're making money. Cool. Um, we had one. That okay. Yeah, I think that helps a lot, right? Is that Patrick? Is that good for you? Ten minutes to a twenty second drill. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah, and I had a. This is a quick one, so I think we, you know, we've only got a couple minutes left, but this should be pretty quick. Um, what is your optic of choice? And and I, and I probably shouldn't say it, but in an S H uh, <laughs> T F uh, type of situation, in a bug out situation. Oh, and then just a, a, a shit gone bad. Yeah, yeah. So, man, there's a ton of sites out, and then you're also looking at distance. Uh, right now, I think the coolest setup and, and, and highly accurate. I ran it at the Colorado Freedom Shoot is. Uh, the Leupold LCO, which is their uh, Leupold's combat optic, it's their flavor of red dot. Um, so you've got a zero magnification, so it's super fast coming up on this thing from you know a yard to 100 yards, no problem, even a little further if you want it. But then they're running this uh, uh, the Leupold optic behind it that's called the Devo, D-D-V-O. And what that is is a constant six power magnification scope, but it offsets, man, so uh, literally, all you're doing is transition. So say if you're looking at yourself in a mirror and you're looking at your nose and you just transition your eyes to your mouth, that's about as far as you're moving your eye to glance down into the six-star magnification that's actually offset. It's right below the, the, the LCO, so it's right behind it. The scope itself is like co-witness, but it's off to the side. So you glance down from red dot, easy money, to, oh, there's a guy at 200 I need to really dial in. You just glance down at the six-power magnification, boom, it's right there, co-witness with your red dot. And uh, it's yeah. exceptionally fast. And that gives you capability from zero to four or 500. Yeah, that's hard to beat, uh, in my opinion. So right now, I'm, I'm really digging that. The other one, if you're not really keen on that, is the uh, the one to six powers. Um, I'm a big fan, and I'm sponsored pro staff for, for Leupold, so uh, that's the, whole, the, the one I'm going to tell you about is, the, is their, uh, their one to six power uh, Mark 6, and that's a pretty sweet, pretty sweet, because now you're going from a one power and you can just dial it out to six power uh, with the twist of the letter on the back, and I've used that in competition and get another sweet, fast one, you could use it for hunting and targets out to four, five hundred, no problem. So another one, there's one uh, very similar by another company that I used to be with. Um, uh, that uh, I won't mention the name, but you probably figured it out pretty quick. There's a couple high-end ones out there. And, uh, yeah. Those okay. are my two, the two of choice right now. If I was going to go with pistol sights, I would say look at like Dawson. They make some really nice stuff, fiber optic front sight type stuff, uh, or high visibility paint on, on a blade, or you know run a loop of, like uh, the RMR type red dot stuff on there. That's going to take money and time to have it milled in. And at some point, you guys are looking to do the SDI gig. You go do that yourself. Right. Cool. All right. I'm. I know that we're out of time here, but I'm supposed to ask you about your Glock 34 as a Colorado freedom yeah. shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I probably would have been more accurate throwing it at it. I, uh, <laughs> bring a second back in. So my Glock 34, the, the there was something up, and it was a little bit high and left. So I'm I'm trying to tear it up, you know, and do do the good thing, and I was just missing constantly, and. Then, uh, one of the boys from uh, FBI handed me a 10 millimeter with some nice sights on it, and I was just like, ting, 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 ting. <laughs> I was like, yeah. So <laughs> my sights weren't quite on on my uh, on my my Glock 34. But that's uh -huh. be uh, that's remedy real soon. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, I think that's uh, that's all the time we have. And I, first of all, Jim, thank you so much for your time, especially coming <laughs> off of that huge well, trip. And I know you're traveling again soon. So thank you, thank yes, you, thank you for your well, time. I taking their time to sign in and, and listen to me slap my gum but I, I'm humbled and, and honored to have y'all yeah um and, and and it's it looks like we have a ton of vets here that have been online with us the whole time so thank you everyone right. for your service um your service thanks and ladies yeah absolutely and thank you for attending tonight and I will be um we have recorded this webinar I'll post a link I'll put it to YouTube, um, and then make sure we share the link to Facebook as well and that type of thing. So one little selfless plug, if you do go for it. I have the ramblings, and then you can find me on Instagram at Jim US Elite or on Facebook at Jim Irwin Elite. And I'd love to have you on and uh, see all the crazy shenanigans I do throughout my my travels. Yep, and I'll um, Jim, I will be sure to tag you in the Facebook status when I, you know, when I do the link to the YouTube video. So 
um, guys, if you want to take a look, you know, when you're, when you're looking at the, uh, the link of the recorded webinar, you can just go directly to his Facebook page from there, too. So, sound good? Awesome. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Thanks for, for your time. Good night. Night.